Hi everybody, and welcome to this new episode of SageMaker Fridays, Season 4. My name is Julian, and I'm a principal developer advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. Once again, please meet my co-presenter. Hi everyone, my name is Ségolène, and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. Uh, my role is uh, to help customers get their ML project on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. All right, great. Thanks again for your time. Thanks for uh, helping us prepare this. So um, this is, once again, uh, a long demo, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, we have a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool use case today. Uh, if you have questions, please ask all your questions. We have uh, friendly and expert moderators who are waiting to help. So please ask all your questions and uh, there are no silly questions. Don't be shy and make sure you learn as much as possible. Okay, that's our only purpose today. Uh, so Sego, what are we doing today? Uh, last week and the week before, we actually covered um, um, recommendation. Uh, we covered uh, fraud, fraud detection. detection. Yeah. And I think today we are zooming in a little bit on healthcare yeah. and life sciences. So exactly. tell us more. Yes, and so this week we are going to work on classifying uh, medical images in order to detect cancerous uh, cells. Okay, so pretty pretty yeah. serious topic. Pretty serious topic. Pretty, um, pretty serious data set. Pretty serious data set. And, uh, and of course... Um, Healthcare and generally life sciences are uh, an area where uh, AI and machine learning are making a big, big difference. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, um, so it's really cool that we get a chance to uh, to talk about that today. Uh, this is the notebook we're going to use on, on GitHub. So uh, go and uh, go and take a look. We'll show it again at the end of the of the session. So I don't worry if you uh, if you didn't have time to uh, to catch this one. Okay. So let's dive into uh, let's dive into the the demo and the, and the use case right away. So um, let me uh, show the, the actual notebook. Okay. Um, so Sego, what are we doing today? Okay. So we're using medical images uh, and and we try to predict uh, whether you know there's a there's a problem in there. But tell us more. Yeah, exactly. So we are we are going to use some uh, images, medical images, and uh, we are going to apply deep learning model uh, on it mm -hmm. uh, on top of uh, on top of the, this data set, and we are going to be able to detect if there is a, a metastasis or not in the image. Okay. So the data set we are going to use for this demo uh, come from the Camelion 16 challenge. Mm -hmm. So and the raw data provided by the challenge has been processed into 96-96 pixel tiles. Mm -hmm. The tile dataset is over the original dataset is over uh, six gigabytes of data. Okay, yeah, so that's that's pretty big. That's pretty big, but uh, in order to easily run this de demo, the dataset has been pruned uh, to the first fourteen thousand images, and okay. uh, of course comes included in the repo with this notebook for convenience. Okay, so uh, we can see some uh, exactly. we can see some images here on screen. We'll, we'll uh, don't worry, we'll look at uh, at the notebook in detail, but just to just to give you a. Another clear video. picture, yeah, exactly. pun not intended uh, of uh, what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn uh, if those pictures are show you know normal cells or if they show cancer cells. Yeah. Exactly, and this color image uh, were extracted from uh, histopathologic scans of uh, lymph node section, and as you can see here, each image is uh, annotated with a binary label indicating presence of uh, metastasis. Metastatic tissue. Okay. So level one metastasis, level bad, zero. Probably bad news, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. bad news and level zero. You're good. Okay. You're good. So hoping we have lots of zeros, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, not always the case. Um, so these are small images, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned ninety-six by ninety-six. Yeah, ninety-six. Uh, so 96. not yeah, not a lot of uh, not a lot of pixels. Um, but still, uh, let's see how well uh, you know how well we can do. And of course, working with small images is is always better when it comes to training time and you know exactly. the, how much compute you need, right? Mm -mm. Um, and so in, intuitively, you would think, oh, we need high res, uh, you know, 4K by 4K images. But for some applications, yes, you you do need that. Uh, you know, satellite images, very very high res. 
uh, uh, images. But in fact, for most computer uh, computer vision applications, we can actually get good results with small images and mm. get them quicker, mm -mm, right? Mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, so again, let's let's see how um, how how well we're doing here. Um, so how, what about let me go back to maybe the, uh, uh, the the first few cells here. Uh, we import some libraries. Uh, we we download the data set. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you can see, this uh, extract is about 350 megs, 69 megs, actually. Mm -hmm. So not huge, right? Uh, we download it locally. We extract it. Uh, so we see exactly what you said, 14K yeah, images, 96, 96 by 96. 96. And of course, three color channels. Three channels because red, green, blue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, the shape of that data. And of course, we have the labels zero or one. Okay. Um, and then we upload that stuff to S3, right? And we delete the local copy just to, to save space. But of course, you can explore those, those images locally if you'd like. So, in fact, here we don't do any data prep. Okay. Uh, but let's step back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because of course here the label, the images are already, already labeled. Okay, so in real life it's not always the case. It's not always the case. No. Okay. Um, so let's imagine you know we we work for a hospital or you know our research lab. We would get uh, we would get plenty of patient images, and then doctors or researchers would actually look at those and say they're okay or. No, unfortunately, they, they, they're not okay. They show cancer cells. And so they, they need to be treated as such. So here we have 14,000 images, mm -hmm. which is a small data set for computer vision. But if we had to go and label all of them ourselves, mm -mm -mm -mm. that's a lot, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and who wants to look at 14,000 images and say 010? It's a lot of work. So how can we help customers if they have to do that? If they're working their own data and they have to label it, is there a service we can use? Yeah, I think that we should use in this case a stage maker ground truth. Okay, so let's let's jump just for a second mm -hmm. <laughs> to uh, to the SageMaker console, and we see. Yeah. Let me zoom in a little bit, and we see this uh, capability called ground truth. And ground truth is, uh, and let's just go and enter this one. Um, it's been specifically built to help you label mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're not going to do the demo right now because there's a lot of stuff we want to cover today, and we like to focus more on training and uh, and tuning uh, the model. We'll actually do that later. Um, probably we'll show you that in in a future episode when mm -hmm. we revisit uh, the the operations aspect of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, machine learning, and uh, I guess we'll go back to this example. So. Really quickly, again, the you know the thirty second uh, whirlwind tour of ground truth would be uh, you can create a job, a labeling job, okay, and as you would expect, your data needs to be in an S three or a storage service. So you would put you would upload your images, your yeah, your raw images to to S three, okay, and then you can create the actual job. And we have some built in task types, okay, and we have images and text. And video, uh, and yeah, video, yeah, oh, why not? Okay. And we can also do point clouds, which is really important if you're doing complex things like autonomous driving. Autonomous okay? driving. 3D yeah. point cloud, super cool. But okay, not our uh, not our purpose today. Video. Okay. So when it comes to images, we can do uh, image classification. So we can create a task where a team of workers mm -hmm. that we create could be um, people. Uh, employees, right? Yeah, a yeah. private team, private team. Um, uh, employees of the company. It could be uh, labeling partners, mm -hmm. uh, so companies that are uh, AWS partners specialized in, uh, in labeling. And uh, it could also be Amazon Mechanical Turk if you needed to scale um, your labeling efforts to maybe millions. In this case, you probably need experts. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, expert labelers, right? Because it's not as simple as saying, well, this is basketball or soccer, or yes, there's a human in the picture. This is really you know, very complex stuff, and you yeah. don't want to label them wrong. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The consequence could be mm -hmm. bad. So in this case, you would have a team of doctors or you know, I don't know, uh, medical students, mm -hmm. you know, all, all the expert uh, 
uh, all the experts you could find, and you create that team and you distribute the work, mm -hmm. right? And so they would go and and uh, visualize individual pictures and, and label them. In the case of classification, you can apply single label, multi-label. So if you're looking for multiple pathologies, uh, you could actually say, I'm seeing this and this and that, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you could do bounding boxes if you wanted to do uh, tumor detection, for mm -hmm, example, mm -hmm, instead of just flagging it, say, yeah, this is the bit is the best, in the yeah. picture where, you know, it's not good. Uh, you could do segmentation if you wanted to actually uh, uh, identify all pixels mm -hmm. uh, of a particular area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So super simple. Uh, again, we'll, we'll probably do a demo in a future episode, but that's the kind of tool you would mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. for uh, for labeling. And uh, and yeah, you just need to define your team. You just need to define. Uh, you just need to upload your data, define the task type, provide some basic instructions, uh, and then all the labeling team gets access to a portal where they actually start seeing images, exactly. labeling them, and then you get that output in S3, and that's the label data set you mm -hmm. can use. Okay, so. Again, very, very cool thing, uh, but we'll, we'll probably come back to that, okay? SageMaker ground truth. Okay, so we don't need to do this here. We have, um, we have the labeled images, um, and we don't really need to do data, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so what we probably need to do is to split, right? Uh, to split and um, for training and, uh, and validation, okay? Mm -hmm. So we just uh, we just do that pretty easily using this uh, this API. So we have eleven thousand images for training, training two thousand for validation, and we keep a test set Offline. for benchmarking. You know, one thousand. Okay, so now we have those three um, data sets. Uh, I guess the next question is, how do we feed those images mm -hmm. to the to the algo? That we're using, so we could very well uh, we could pass them as a file tree, so to speak, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. an object tree in S3. Okay, so that's that's possible, but it's a lot of files, mm. right? And for convenience reasons and performance reasons, we don't want to have to deal with thousands of files. And again, this is a small data set. Imagine imagine millions of mm -hmm, them, mm -hmm. right? Copying, moving them around, making sure none is missing. You know, the more you have, <laughs> the more painful it is. Exactly. Yeah. So one step we're going to take here is we're actually going to pack mm -hmm. uh, to those images into uh, a single file, mm -hmm. a single file per data set. Okay? So we'll have one large file for training with all the images in there, same for validation, same for Mm -hmm. Okay, and that makes it more convenient to uh, to move around to archive version mm -hmm. if you're working with different versions of your data, uh, and it makes it easier and more efficient to send to the training instance and maybe to split if you use distributed training, which ah. we might be doing <laughs> later. <laughs> okay, so if you have one big file, you can you know split it in chunks and and send the chunks to the different training instances, instead of sending individual files mm -hmm. where you get a lot of, uh, let's say, you know, IO overhead, you know, mm -hmm. working with thousands, potentially millions of files. So um, this is what we're doing here. And so we're using a file format, which is called record IO, mm -hmm. which is actually part of, uh, of uh, Apache MXNet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's, the, there's an equivalent format in TensorFlow. If you're familiar with TensorFlow, you've certainly seen uh, TF record mm -hmm. uh, files, same story. Mm -hmm. Okay, we pack, uh, we pack small uh, instances into one single file. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. So here we're reading all our images in each data set, as we can see here, training, validation, and test. Okay, and we write them in record IO format into a single file. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and we can apply extra. Uh, quality, compression, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we have really large images, we can you know, shrink them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And we save images in, in JPEG format, okay? So it's it looks a little complex, but that's really what we're doing. Yeah. Reading images, writing them into a record structure file, mm -hmm. okay? 
And actually, we get we get two files. Once we've done that, we can certainly see them here. Uh, so, for example, we see that uh, we have an IDX file, which is an index file, and this is actually a text file that gives you the offset of each image inside the bigger okay. record IO file. Okay, so um, so that's uh, that's pretty simple. So we see all our training images. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go and grab one particular image, we know where it sits. Mm -hmm. And of course, the record IO file is a binary file with all those images packed into it. Okay, so just this is generic code uh, as uh, as long as you're feeding it, uh, you know, NumPy arrays, it works. Okay, and the array is just the uh, it's just the uh, the equivalent of a NumPy array in MX. So, but that's uh, pretty compatible. So you can reuse that code um, as is, I think. Okay, so we do this three times. Okay, so now we have our three record IO files. We upload them uh, to S3. S3. Okay. Of course, we have labels, I forgot to say, but that's okay. obviously we have the labels in there as well. Um, and now we're ready. Okay, so you know, compared to previous episode, it's you know we don't do data prep, mm -hmm. we don't do feature engineering. We just do, uh, you know, we just package exactly package the images to make them easier to uh, to work with. So let's get to the really uh, you know important stuff now. So which algo are we going to use here? So as you see here in the in the code, we are using we are going to use a building um, algorithm of SageMaker, which is the image classification algorithm. So uh, this building algo is a supervised uh, learning algo that mm -hmm. supports uh, multi-level classification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can actually look at that. It's, yeah, know, here's exactly. the idea, the exactly. SageMaker doc. And it takes an image. It's called image classification algorithm. So you kind of know, you know, <laughs> you know what it does. <laughs> It's a good name. It's a good name, yes, exactly. And uh, actually, it's going to use a convolutional neural network, the ResNet, okay. that can be either trained uh, from scratch or trained using transfer learning technique, mm -hmm. uh, especially when a large number of training images are not available. Okay. Um, so, yes, so you, it can be run in two modes, so uh, full training and transfer learning, we mm -hmm. will see that. And um, in full training mode, uh, the network is initialized, initialized with random weights and trained on user data from scratch. Okay. In transfer learning mode, and this is important because we are going to use it today, the network is initialized with pre-trained weights and just the top fully connected layer is initialized with random weights. Okay, so yeah, that's a good, it's a good question to ask. Uh, so we're using ResNet, which is a, a you know well-known, well uh, efficient image classifier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's been it's been around for a few years now. It works very well. People understand it pretty well. Um, but in this case, do we train from scratch or do we start from pre-trained uh, weights? Because we we have two classes, right? Zero mm -hmm. uh, and one, and we have fourteen thousand images. So mm -hmm. I haven't checked how balanced they are, but uh, you know that we have thousands of samples for uh, for each class, and and the images are not really big. Uh, they're not super super complex. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we will be starting from a pre-trained model, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, and see if it works. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you if we look at the images once again, we see, I would say, basic geometrical shapes. Exactly. Yes, yeah. we see you know we see uh, circles, yeah, we okay. see diagonals. Um, you know we don't obviously there's complexity in there, but you could say well you know medical images these are really really different from everyday life images that you would find in the ImageNet data set, yeah, exactly. which is usually, usually what we use for pre-training. But again, um, the, the basic patterns that we see here, right? Like we see, you know, like diagonals, we see, you know, dots, we see circles, we see ovals, we see textures, we see color gradients. These, are pro these have probably been learned mm -mm -mm. by the, by mm -mm. the pre-trained model. So um, so it's worth a shot. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. worth a shot. 
Um, let's let's do transfer learning. Let's just train for a small number of epochs. Mm -hmm. Let's see what kind of accuracy we get. Exactly. Okay. If it if it's not too good, then I guess we could start from scratch. Um, and again, for demo purposes, we have a small number of images. But if we use million of images, maybe. you know, maybe maybe we could train from scratch. But you know, it's a balance. It's a balance between training time and uh, and and you know, uh, budget and everything. So here we're gonna try. So let's let's go back to uh, to this, okay? Um, and so we use that image classification algo, as you mentioned, it's built ResNet, in. okay? It's built in. Built in yeah. So we just retrieve the the container yeah. because uh, training and and for that matter, deployment activity in SageMaker is based on on Docker containers. But in this case, it's already there. So the only thing we need to do is grab its name. Um, we need to find uh, the number of training samples that we have, the number of classes that we have, um, because obviously these are hyperparameters. Mm. So let's take a look at those at those hyperparameters. Um, okay, so the first one is number of layers, and of course, again, they are, you know, available in doc, so you okay. can go and, and read them, right? Some are required, some are optional. Okay, so my advice always the same: start with only the required one, mm -mm. get your baseline, and then start tweaking. Right, uh, and then uh, if you don't want to tweak, use model tuning. But we'll <laughs> see that later. Okay, so what did we set here? So fifty layers mm -hmm. for ResNet. ResNet fifty. ResNet fifty. It's kind of the mid-size uh, model. You could do eight, eighteen. I think is the smallest. Yeah, and the biggest is one fifty-two. I think. Now let's check. Why should? What am I guessing? Let's uh, number of layers. Number of layers. Is it possible? No, it's not going to be the first one. Uh, come on. Ah, yes, yeah. Fifty one hundred fifty-two uh, or two hundred. Okay, yeah. For transfer learning, we can do from eighteen to two hundred. Two hundred. Okay, and for uh, yeah. Data with small image size. You see, just selecting 20, 32, 44, 56, 1. Okay, fine. So we're doing transfer learning. So we're kind of in the middle. Okay. 18 is going to train much faster, mm -hmm. but accuracy Maybe, yeah. could be lower because mm -hmm. we have fewer parameters to learn. Uh, 200 is going to be much slower, <laughs> yeah. but potentially it gives you better accuracy. Okay, so okay, let's go with 50. Which is a reasonable first attempt. Let's see what we get. Okay. Yeah, to create a baseline. Yeah, for now we're trying to get a baseline and, and then see, you know, can we use classification on this problem? We're trying to get a quick sense of is there a, a machine learning solution to this? And if we get good accuracy, then we can go crazy with your <laughs> exactly, model. Exactly, and yeah? iterate again and, and iterate again. And iterate on larger, uh, on larger uh, networks. Okay. So we use a pre-trained model. Yes, I said one. Okay. okay so you said that. Zero. Yeah. So zero means start from scratch. One means uh, weights are pre-initialized. Augmentation type. So tell us about that one. What what does that do? So that's super interesting. Uh, indeed, uh, this is hyper hyperparameter hyper hyperparameter in the image classification algorithm. It's super interesting because uh, the input images can be augmented uh, in multiple ways. So. What does it mean here? Color, crop, crop color transform. So uh, you're gonna have some uh, random transformation, such mm -hmm. as uh, including rotation, shear, and okay. um, aspect. So we are actually creating. Exactly. We're adding new samples. Exactly. That are weak, distorted, altered. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And this will help the algorithm to generalize better especially since we are uh, dealing with medical images. So. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, a good, it's a good idea to have this one here because you can see, you know, color, lighting, color, uh -uh. Uh, weather, the, Rotation. you know, for example, this one here. So, I, uh, you know, I'm guessing, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, obviously. I'm not sure which particular area is of interest here, but it could, it's, not, it's not dead in the center, mm -hmm. right? It, Depending on how that picture was taken, you know, the, the area of interest could be somewhere in a corner or, mm -hmm. you know, these are not pixel perfect picture taken by mm -hmm. a, a professional photographer. Okay, <laughs> they, they come from, you know, machines, etc., etc. Maybe they've been cropped, maybe, you know, you know, maybe that's the interesting bit or maybe that's the interesting bit. And, uh, 
you know, it's not always going to be nicely in the center for exactly. you to examine. So, <laughs> so yeah, Im image augmentation is a good way to create to slightly more hostile mm -mm. samples that help your model learn better. You make the model train harder, mm -mm. right? Mm -mm. Okay, so good one. Um, okay, image shape we've already discussed. Um, number of classes is pretty obvious. Two, uh, number of training samples we already know. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have a few machine learning parameters. Batch size. So we have four. Oh, how, how many do we have in the training set? 12,000? 11,000. Okay, so 64. Yes. That's fine. Uh, you know, it gives us, uh, you know, hundreds of, uh, of batches per mm -hmm. uh, epoch. Yeah, so it's an okay starting point. But do you, what if you use 32 or 128, right? Mm. Hmm. Mm. Uh, epochs, you know, five, which is a, a reasonable, a reasonable low number. Low number We're doing yeah. transfer learning, so we shouldn't be training for longer than, I don't know, you know maybe ten is the max. Uh, but just a handful of epochs. Learning rate, the hardest of all parameters to pick. Mm. So we'll stick with this, which I think is actually the the default value in the, in the doc. Uh, we find it. Learn. Oh, where is it? Oh yeah, sorry. Learning rate. I think it's zero. Oh no, zero, zero one, one is the no default. Okay, so we actually try uh, a slightly lower learning rate, which makes sense for mm -hmm. um, transfer learning, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you want to fine tune. You don't want to make huge adjustments. You just want to specialize for. And precision type. So we're training with a uh, thirty-two bit weights mm -hmm. um, for maximum precision. Uh, we could uh, speed up training and. And reduce model size with float 16 but again yeah, not a huge concern okay and again there are plenty of other parameters but these are the ones that are really important okay um so now we need to configure the training job so um and we're going to use that estimator object if you've seen previous episodes or if you're already working with SageMaker, you know it's really central um here we're using uh the generic estimator for built-in algos, but we have specialized estimators for TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. Uh, so we pass hyperparameters, we pass the, um, the location of the training container, mm -hmm. but we found the role is for permissions, uh, you know, access to S3, access to the container, etc. Oh, Infrastructure requirements. Okay, so here we are doing distributed training, because why not? So we're using two single GPU instances, okay? So P3 is a GPU family, and 2XL is the entry level size. So they have one GPU, but we have multi-GPU instances as well. Okay, so two instances will collaborate. Volume size is uh, how much storage mm -hmm. uh, uh, each training instance gets, okay? So here, uh, by default, you only get five, five gigs. Um, which might be a little small, so I don't think we need a hundred, but okay, it's, uh, you know, it's just for safety, let's say, <laughs> okay? Because uh, we'll need to copy the data set, we need to save the model, um, you know, we could be using checkpointing, so mm. we have different checkpoints for the model, etc. Okay, 100 honestly is probably a little too much. Uh, max run is the maximum training time, so 10 hours. Again, that's, <laughs> that's a little too much. <laughs> We're not going to need this at VLC. And then um, the output path. Okay, where do we save the model? Okay, so I'll go hyperparameters, estimator parameters for the training job. And we could train right away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could call image classifier dot fit, passing the location of the training set, the validation set, uh, as, as we've seen before. And we would train a single job. And we've done this in, in again, the, the, the previous episode. But yes. <laughs> coming back to my batch size and learning rate, you know, we, we know from experience these have a huge impact on, mm -hmm. the, on the image classification algorithm, especially. Yeah, especially. So, okay, feel free to train a single job and see what, what accuracy you get. Uh, and then how do you do how do you do better? So you do better with this 
hyperparameter tuning capability in SageMaker, which is one of my really one of my favorite features. Because one, it's super easy to use. So for lazy people like lazy me, people it's are exactly. awesome. <laughs> it does the work for you. You can fire fire up your tuning job. I know. Pre so. Yeah, <laughs> and pretend pretend you're working, <laughs> and then you can report really good results, and uh, and you haven't done anything. SageMaker's already already done the work for you. <laughs> so the way the way this works is super simple. So you define hyperparameters that you want to optimize on. Mm -hmm right and you define ranges okay? okay so for example here i'm saying hey i'd like to explore batch sizes between 16 and 128 okay so these are discrete values between mm -hmm. 16 and 120 integer values and i want to explore the learning rate which is a floating point value mm -hmm. so we use a continuous parameter and we like to explore from you know 0 0.0001 to 0 0.0 Right, which are again reasonable values when you're fine tuning, and I can I can specify that these should be explored using a logarithmic scale, because I'm not really interested in trying 0. 0.0002. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I really want to try you know the different orders of magnitude. So I want to I'm really saying hey go and explore those different di different orders of magnitude. Don't go and try 0. 0. 0.00015 and 0. 0.00017. You know, it you know, I, yeah, it doesn't probably doesn't make sense, especially early on. I want to get a quick se sense here of, okay, what's the what's the kind of learning rate I need to use here, okay, and then we can keep tweaking, of course, and we can run successive tuning jobs where you know zoom in on on very uh, high performance parameter ranges. But here we're just trying to get a sense, and then we define the tuner where we pass the estimator that we created mm -hmm. just above. With the metric we would like to optimize for, so by addition accuracy. Which the, is the ratio of the number of correct prediction sure. to the total number of yes. prediction made. Absolutely. Uh, parameter ranges, how many jobs I want to run. Mm -hmm. So here I'm only running 20. If you no, that's not too much. That's not a lot. I'll get back to that. We don't need much more. Uh, I'm going to run them two by two mm -hmm. right, to speed things up. So, you know, you could run them sequentially, but you can speed up a little bit. And, and yeah, a prefix, a base, a base name for, for the tuning jobs. So before we actually go and run it, let's talk about the strategy here. Uh, so what really happens here? So what happens here is, so we're going to try, we're going to train uh, those first two jobs. Okay. And of course, initially we start for the first job, we randomly select values here. Okay. Okay. And we, we see what kind of accuracy we get. Okay. And then we apply machine learning optimization. Uh, so uh, Bayesian optimization to pick the next set of hyperparameters to mm. try. So we get a second data point, right? Um, and here the data point is really, you know, what accuracy do I get given that mm. pair of batch size and learning rate? And so you apply optimization to that and, and you pick another set of parameters. And now you have three data points and four and five. And so gradually um, you can estimate where to look next. Exactly. Okay. And this is super efficient and, and generally, you know, it converges quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other techniques for uh, hyperparameter optimization. There's one called grid search where, you know, you explore uh, systematically, you know, you mm -hmm. divide those parameter ranges in grids, you know, and you and you train, you pick you pick values in all the grids, and you know, you systematically explore. So uh, that works, but it usually takes 10x, right? Um, you can argue on that one, but uh, probably 10x as many uh, uh, 10x the number of jobs to get similar results. So it takes longer. Costs more. Oh. Yes. Because I'm not only lazy, I'm very cheap. Okay? Uh, and so 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 should you be, because it's your money you're spending here. You know, I don't pay my bills, as you know, my AWS bills. I pay the other ones. Um, there's another technical random search where we pick parameters at random. And you think, oh, that sounds completely stupid, except uh, this has been proven to work better by uh, than, than uh, grid search. 
and uh, and one of the authors of that paper is uh, is Mr. Yoshi Abengio. Uh, <laughs> if the name you know means nothing to you, is uh, he won a Turing Award for uh, AI contributions not so long ago. So I will not argue with that. Okay, <laughs> not today, not tomorrow. And so, but random search again. Uh, generally takes more jobs. So, um, so in a nutshell, Bayesian works pretty nicely. You can try random. Uh, there's an extra parameter here uh, that sets the strategy. By default, it uses Bayesian, but you can use random, and that's a good baseline as well. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't buy my uh, Bayesian works better pitch, try random, and then go try Bayesian, and then ping me. Okay. <laughs> and if it still didn't work better, yeah. Ping me anyway. Uh, we'll figure out what. That's a fun thing. Okay. So that's that's uh, how you do it. And then we define our training inputs and then we train. Right. Yes. Okay, but that's don't go too fast. <laughs> yeah, I just want to show you that actually, you know, uh, running a tuning job is is not more complicated mm. than running a standalone job. Mm -mm. You can figure the estimator. Uh, Define your ranges, define those few things here. Okay, so that's the only extra stuff you need to do. And then you call fit, and then we'll see what happens. Okay. 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 Now, yes, you are right. When you when we selected our training inputs, compared to previous examples in the past few weeks, we have this new parameter that says input mode pipe. So what does that mean? <laughs> Default is file mode. File mode copies the training set the training instances, mm -hmm. okay? So we just, whatever we have, we copy to the training instances and, and they start training. Okay. So that's fine, but if you have a big data set, it could take, even if you have fast network, um, you know, if you have multi-gigabyte, tens of gigabytes, you know, yeah, you, you, you need some time to copy, you need to provision space mm -hmm. on the instances as we've seen uh, with that volume uh, size thing earlier. And let's say you have a terabyte data set. Ouch. Okay, do you want to copy one no. terabyte over the network? No, no, no. no, no. Uh, especially to multiple instances, because <laughs> if you have a one terabyte data set, I'm guessing you're, you're doing it. You're going to distribute it. You're yeah. going to distribute it. Um, and do you want to provision one terabyte of storage on each training instance, even no. though it's not super, super expensive? No. So what you want to do is stream. Ah. Okay, so you don't download you stream, okay? And this is what pipe mode is. So we don't copy, we stream the data to the training instance. Mm -hmm. So lots of good things about that. First, we waste no time copying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So training pretty much starts immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and even if we have uh, super huge data sets, mm -hmm. we can train. Mm -hmm. if you have a, technically, if you have a petabyte data set, it works. Right, because you don't need any storage mm -hmm. on your training instance, so there's no uh, no limitation there, um, and the data set doesn't need to be loaded in memory. So you kind of decouple data set size and uh, storage size and memory size on training. Mm -hmm. So you can scale out to lots of even smaller instances because they they're only getting small chunks at a time. So um, this pipe mode, okay. Yeah, so pipe mode is super cool. Once super you start cool. moving to let's say you know, gigabyte scale data sets, it's, it's a good technique. Okay, and record IO makes it very simple to split mm. because we have this record structure in the file. So it makes it easy to split the, and create the chunks and send them to instances. See, it all works. <laughs> we thought about this. Okay, so we call fit. We call fit. What now? Lots of dots. Okay. <laughs> And yeah, an exclamation mark that says, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. So what That's happened there? Is. So what happened there is we started running those training jobs two by two, like uh -huh. I said, uh -huh. uh, picking, initially picking random values for hyperparameters and then using the clever optimization techniques to figure out the next and hopefully over time converging to better, better models. Mm. So where do you visualize results? Okay. Because you don't see a training log here because keep in mind we did train 20 jobs okay so when you have a standalone training job you get your training log when you run fit here you don't see the training log in notebooks would be super confusing to see those 20 logs so 
you can easily use this uh, hyperparameter tuning job analytics, which is a very long name, but simple object, to actually extract all the results. Mm -hmm. Okay, as a pandas data frame, and here I sort them by uh, descending objective value. Okay, so we see that the top job uh, reached 0.90 something mm -hmm. percent validation accuracy, uh, which is a very good starting point. Okay, and uh, we can see this is job 13, mm -hmm. right? In the 20, or probably, yeah, yeah it's, the, it's the 14th, I guess. I don't know, do we start at zero? Yeah, we start at zero. Okay, so it's the 14th job. So it took a little while to converge to uh -huh. this, okay? And then the next ones didn't get any better than that. And if we look at the first few jobs, for example, job zero was 87%, and you know, job one was 88, job two was again close to 88, okay. job three, 87. So exploration, 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 you know, and you know, five, six, oh, oh. this is better, okay? So six got better. Uh, seven was uh, a, yeah, <laughs> a, a bad bet, okay? We explored too far in that hyperparameter space, so oh, not so good. Eight, a little better. Nine, a little better. Ten, nah, not, not great. You know, good. Eleven got better. Twelve, not so, but not so good. But see, step by step, and of course, it's not a linear process. It's just, you know, we kind of explore and... and, and take bets on, on those parameter values. But, you know, we got to 90 plus percent. Always iteration, right? Yeah. And, and if we trained a little more and we explored and tweaked more hyperparameters, we, mm. we could certainly do better. Then, of course, we could add more data. Mm -hmm. We could uh, we could try a, a, a large, a deeper ResNet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, but training time here was, as you can see, very short. Oh. It's about four, four minutes, four minutes yeah, something okay. like that. Yeah, about, about four minutes per model. Yeah, you see the seconds here, three, four minutes. So that's okay. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, for experimentation, it's pretty good. And of course, we see the winning learning rate, so to speak, was this, and the batch size was this. And of course, we would have never uh, thought of using that, right? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. So anyway, uh, and we can see, yeah, the, the the super tiny learning rate don't really work. Mm -hmm. right. The worst one is actually a very, it's, I think, the lowest learning rate of all. So, yeah, we could see, okay, this is too tiny. So maybe we could restrict the, the range and run another tuning job to explore maybe a more, more meaningful range, right? We see, the, uh, we see the, the top three models are kind of, you know, in the same area. So we may, we may want to explore it. Okay. Uh, you can also go to the, the SageMaker console. Um, and you can see hyperparameter tuning jobs. And okay, so we see the 20 jobs here. We see the best one. Of course, same results. Oof. Okay, and uh, so we see all the hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. And if we want to see the actual training log for this one, you know, we'll find it. So the logs that you actually see in the notebook also are pushed to a CloudWatch, CloudWatch. our monitoring service. So you can actually, and we see two logs because we have two training instances, right? And yeah, of course here you can see the you can see the log, and you can see a checkpointing was actually running automatically, so that's pretty good, etc. Uh, etc. Et okay, so super super easy to use. So this is how uh, we're almost at the end. So to sum things up, um, this is how you can easily train a classification model, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, you know summing things up. What did we really do here? You know, we started from uh, from a bunch of images, okay. So already labeled, but uh, again, uh, in the future episode we'll do uh, you know we'll show you labeling with a, uh, we'll show you labeling with a SageMaker Ground Truth. Okay, so no processing in here. Um, with real life images, probably you would train them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing those original images coming out of the medical equipment are high res. Uh, so you could just resize them uh, automatically. And then you train and split. Um, we use a record audio format because we think it's cool, we think it's efficient, it's easier to move the files around, it makes it easy to split them. Uh, you could work with a uh, 
uh, your image uh, hierarchies if you wanted. We put them in S3. Configure the estimator with that built-in algo uh, with the hyperparameters that we saw. Okay, and then we could train a single model, but we go with model tuning and, and we enjoy uh, this run for an hour, by the way. And we can go and do something else. Of course, we'll work. we're not slacking. We're never slacking. <laughs> tuning is just not another an opportunity to do other interesting things. Exactly. exactly. Or... That's, that's who we are. <laughs> and, and then we see results. Okay. So really not difficult. So yeah. uh, so if you have your own medical uh, images out there, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping we have uh, machine learning engineers and data scientists who work in, uh, you know, healthcare and life sciences um, uh, organizations and companies. You know, go and try it. You know, go and start from that notebook, tweak it, tear it apart, add your own images, and and see, you know, in in a couple of hours what kind of results you can get. Mm. Okay. That, as you can see, it's really not super difficult, and maybe you can come up with a, a very impactful uh, results. And uh, and yeah, we certainly hope that uh, you 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 achieve them, especially especially for th that kind of application, mm -mm. okay, which are so important for everybody. Okay, so uh, let me show you, uh, and and yeah, forgot to say, of course, we we could deploy the model, we could automate, automate all of that. Them. And and we'll come back to that okay exactly. uh, in, in those uh, in those future episodes. Let me uh, show you that slide again. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, in a few weeks, we'll come back to uh, automation and uh, and we'll show you how to run uh, complete automation of this. Exactly. Okay. And we'll talk about deployment and predicting and and other things. Okay. So once again, this is the notebook we use today. I hope you uh, learned a few things. I hope you got your questions answered. And, uh, and we'll see you next week for uh, another cool uh, use case on recommendation again, mm -hmm. but this time for the retail uh, industry. Okay, So we hope uh, you're going to join us next time. And Sego, thanks again. It was a, good, again. a really good one, I think. <laughs> really, really important one. And for important. Very, very Definitely important use is. cases. So go and go and, and, and you know, help people get better. Okay. Until next time, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.